Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Missing Link for SLPs podcast. We are starting a new series, and I put a thing out there on Facebook in Medical SLP land, and I asked for 12 people to step up to the podcast who would be interested, and I had more than 27 returns when I closed it like 24 hours later. So we have a line of medical SLPs lined up for you, ready to talk to you. And I'm so excited because we're just going to talk about what it looks like in their day. So this is the first in the series of A Day in the Life of Medical SLP. And our first guest is Jessica Shell. And she is a speech pathologist who's been in the field for 15 years, working in the home health and skilled nursing areas. So welcome, Jessica. Hello and welcome to the Missing Link for the SLPs podcast. I am so glad you are here. Today's episode is part of the Medical SLP series where we talk to some amazing speech paths who work in a variety of medical settings, all the way from intensive care through to home care and everything else in between and beyond. You're gonna hear some incredible medical SLP stories and lots of advice from these passionate medical SLPs. Welcome to the Missing Link for SLPs, Jessica. Good to have you here. Thank you for having me. So you are the first that has lined up for the series, A Day in the Life of the Medical SLP. Would you, and your setting is skilled nursing and home health? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Tell us how you got started as a speech pathologist. Um, Well, I was a business major as a freshman in college, and I found out that I was very bad at math and the macroeconomics. And I had an aunt who was in graduate school at the time. And she said, you should try speech, speech pathology. I think you'd really like it. So I took my first intro courses as a sophomore. And I thought, well, when I fail out, I'll just, you know, find something different. And I never failed out, which was kind of a shock. And I just went all the way through and graduated and found myself as a speech language pathologist. Excellent story. Good story. And you've been in it for how long? 15 years. I finished, I did my master's in 2006. Okay. So you stepped up for this series because you wanted to talk about what your day was like as a medical SLP. So tell us, can you walk us through a typical day? When does it start? When does it end? Um, I usually get to my facility about 745 in the morning. It's before breakfast. So I check in and see what my schedule looks like. That's one of the reasons that I like working in skilled nursing is because I have a decent idea of what my day is going to look like versus our colleagues in acute care. They tend to have a lot of different folks every day. So it's kind of a personality thing. I just like having that consistency. Um, I get in and I check in. Then I print off my schedule. I try to see some folks at breakfast to make sure that my strategies are in place, that our tickets are right, that they're getting the right diet texture, stuff like that. It's also good to check in with the staff and see if they have any new concerns for the day. Sometimes folks have acute episodes that things change even overnight. So it's good to check in and make sure nothing like that has happened overnight or over the weekend. After that, I usually do a lot of cognitive therapy. Some folks don't understand that in skilled nursing, we do have a fair amount of patients that do go home. Um, There's kind of a bad reputation for skilled nursing that once you're admitted, the only way out is out out on a stretcher. And that's definitely not the case. Um, Can we pause for just a second? Take us back for those who don't know what, and I didn't know, I didn't think of asking this. I'm following you perfectly because I work (laughs) in skilled nursing. And I'm thinking maybe there's some listeners out there who don't know what a skilled nursing is and what home-based speech pathology looks like. So skilled nursing, tell us basically what that is. So skilled nursing is People refer to them as a nursing home, and we do have a section for folks that are going to stay long-term, and Mm -hmm. it's called long-term care. So they Mm -hmm. are going to stay with us for the foreseeable future and probably to the end of their lives. 
not necessarily. We have mm-hmm. had many long-term care patients that have gone home or to lesser level of cares like assisted living, independent living, living with their families at home. And then we have another section of our building that's dedicated to those folks that do plan on leaving and going home with family, home independently, into independent living facilities, into assisted living facilities. And their care is definitely different than those that we treat for long term. Um, our, our skilled patients are the ones that we foresee going to a lesser level of care, like I said. So we target functional community things more like cooking and medication management and safety and all those sorts of things that will make them safe and independent at, at the least restrictive living environment they can be in. Wonderful. Excellent. So very clear. So you get them sometimes from hospitals and from uh, your referrals from hospitals and other places like that where they discharge and sometimes their short-term stay and then they go on to other settings, maybe assisted living or home with assistance. Sometimes they stay more long-term. All right. Yes. Yep. And that, you know, you never know what you're going to get. Some people get into skilled nursing and they think, you know, this is way better than sitting at home by myself. I have people Mm -hmm. here. I have someone to take care of me. We have a lot of folks that do choose to stay long-term just because it's actually Mm -hmm. a more functional living environment than what they've been used to. And skilled nursings are also called SNFs. Yes. So if you come across that in the hospital, which I did my internship in the hospital. I spent a good eight weeks not knowing what a SNF was. SNF was. And it's, what's the acronym? <laughs> SNF. SNF. Skilled Nursing yeah. Facility. Oh, no mm-hmm. eyes in there at all. No all eyes. right. So back on track, you describe that you start at 745, you see your dysphagia, and then you work in through your cognitive patients. Yes. I, I tend to check in with physical and occupational therapy. We do a lot of work together because our ultimate goal is the highest level of function, discharge to lesser level of care, whatever that is. So we want to make sure we're coordinating all of our treatments together. Um, We sometimes do cooking tasks. We do cognitive tasks, anything along those lines, communication tasks, make sure they know what questions to ask and how to ask them and how to get services they need. Everything like that, if there is obstacles that we think that they're going to have, how can we address those obstacles so that when they do go home, they have the best shot at staying there. So that's kind of my morning. In my afternoon, I do lunch again, check in with folks and see what it looks like as far as strategies, swallowing, making sure my patients that I want in the dining room getting assistance are getting assistance. I do work with occupational therapy as they help with feeding. I do work a lot with physical therapy in the dining room, which a lot of people don't really think about. But if you have a patient who can't maintain a good posture, Mm -hmm. your swallowing therapy is not going to be nearly as successful. So a lot of times I ask for help from my physical and occupational therapy colleagues because they're also part of the swallowing treatment, even though most of it's based with speech therapy. Therapy. Very in the afternoon, uh, in the afternoon, I finish up more cognitive communication treatments. I always check in and make sure there's no more evals. They can have evaluations, and then I would do those in the afternoon. Usually, follow up on any orders, anything the doctors or nurse practitioners want me to look into, and I'm usually done about three thirty. Sounds sounds very organized and scheduled. <laughs> it doesn't look that way, but it does sound that way. <laughs> it does. Tell us about, um, let's see, productivity requirements. I know we might as well get that right off the top. Um, tell us about what your productivity requirements are. My productivity is 88%. It's been 88% for quite a long time. We are encouraged to document um when we're with our patients, we're encouraged to document while we're doing treatment, like at the end, if they're doing a worksheet or we're talking about their goals, things like that. It has changed because of COVID. We aren't really encouraged to take a lot of devices into rooms. You have to clean them. You're wearing all your PPE, all that good stuff. So that's kind of been not the norm for the last year. That is generally what we do, though. Um, I, my, our rehab director advises us to reach productivity. It's not do or die. 
we need to be productive. It's part of time management. Mm -hmm. So I understand that it's necessary, but I know there's a lot of ethical concerns that I've heard throughout our organizations that have those problems with productivity. And I've definitely seen that out there. I don't feel like I experienced that right now, but it's definitely something to keep in mind. When I was getting ready to interview you and getting ready for this podcast, I looked through, you had given me some resources and you wrote wrote two articles. One of them is 10 things you don't learn. You didn't learn in, in SLP graduate school. And the other one is the ultimate interview guide for new grad SLPs. And those will be in the show notes. Both of them, I thought, took such a realistic view. And you're like, productivity is part of the job. It's what it is. And, you know, in grad school, we're measured by our grades. And that's what we have to pass. And in the work setting, we all have productivity standards that we have to meet. And so that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. It's it's part of time management. I think if there was no productivity requirement, you would see folks that would end up with poor time management skills across all disciplines. That being said, there are a lot of perils with productivity. So there are many issues that I think need to be worked out. But I think there could be a balance at some point. So for the new graduate student moving into a SNF, what types of advice would you have for him or her um, regarding productivity? I would definitely ask about it in the interview. Uh, I think 80 to 85 is pretty reasonable. Like I said, I have 88%. I do have a fairly small building. So going back and forth doesn't take me very long. I know we've had some colleagues who have said it takes me 10 minutes to get to a room and that's not my situation. So that is a difference. I would tell them to inquire what exactly counts. I, I tell my students, I, I'm an intern supervisor for our local college. So I see a lot of speech students and I tell them to think about it as billable versus non-billable because mm-hmm. that makes it different. There's a lot of things you have to do for your patients. That's non-billable. And you're expected to do that, but you can't count that as productivity. So that's an obstacle. So I definitely would have them inquire about what do they view billable versus non-billable? How do you accommodate both of those things? Is there help that you can get? Some some companies have rehab techs that can bring patient to the, to the therapy gym or to where you need them to be. Other companies have time built into productivity for documentation, talking to doctors, whatnot. So that's definitely something you want to inquire about before you take a job. Good advice. And managing time. And managing time. And as a CF in a new environment, you're not going to be able to manage your time when you start. It's very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And you need to expect that it's going to be overwhelming and it's going to take some time to adjust. And you want to work for a company that understands that there's no CF on this planet that is going to walk into a facility on their first day and be productive Mm -hmm. to the point that their company wants them to be. That's impossible. And the company just needs to understand that. And that's a question that I would ask, you know, how long until you expect me to be this productive? Because I'm going to need to learn all this stuff. That's a good question. Very good question. So working in SNFs, what is your primary pa- patient population that you treat? What primary etiologies, diagnoses do you work with? I feel like in this area of the country, and my physical therapist and I have talked about this, we see a lot of multiple sclerosis. In what area of the country are you in? Um, I'm in northern Colorado. Okay. I don't think and for some that. and for some reason we feel we we've had this conversation like we should do a research study honestly because we feel that we see a lot of multiple sclerosis and as a speech therapist that can mean you have dysphagia you have dysarthria you have cognitive mm-hmm. issues it can manifest in so many different ways and I feel that we have a very large population of multiple sclerosis in here we also have cognitive issues, early onset Alzheimer's, early dementia. Um, I've had some traumatic brain injury in the nursing home. You do see a lot of Parkinson's, things like that. How about documentation? Talk talk to us about documentation in a SNF. Documentation in a SNF is fast. (laughs) It's expected to be fast. I usually do a quick 
I don't even know that I'd call it a soap note. It's a little blurb of what I do during the day. And then every 10 visits, I have to do a progress note, which would which I would consider being more of a soap note that we're taught in graduate school. You get into more of the details of things. This is how they're progressing. This is what is happening that's making them not progress, things like that. And then every 90 days, you would do a recertification if you're continuing to see them. And that would entail kind of a more in-depth progress note. And I do an evaluation that usually takes place with a basic screener. We don't generally do a lot of the in-depth cognitive tests because they take too long and our patients kind of can't handle them. It's, it's too overwhelming to whip out. I have a ripe G, but I don't do a Boston often. I don't do things like that because they're just too overwhelming and time consuming. And my patients tend to get very frustrated with that. Opportunities for growth in the SNF. Generally, the most direct opportunity for growth is to become a rehab director. So that would be the person in charge of the rehab team. And then you could go on with that. You could go on to be a district person, a national person within your company. And that could be a variety of positions. You could oversee rehab director. You could do compliance. You could make sure that we're following all the new laws and regulations. And there are a lot and they vary with the states. So there are people out there that are in, in charge of knowing under all of that and making sure we understand all of that. So if you're, a fresh grad student in your option, you really want to step into the medical setting and you view a SNF opportunity as a way of starting, would you, I think you'd recommend this. Yes. I know I would. I would. Yes. I feel like you do have to have, I don't know if I would call it a desire, but a want to work with the elderly population. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone is successful in the SNF setting if they really don't like that population. And that's fair. I, I don't like to work with kids. <laughs> so working in the SNF was the best population for me because I liked that population. So if you're doing it as a means to an end, and I understand that a lot of us have to do things like that, be aware that you have to like the population on some level for you to want to be in that job. And go in eyes wide open, knowing some of the the challenges you're going to have. Which... And there are a lot of challenges, especially mm-hmm. a lot of companies in SNFs don't have the caseload to support two speech therapists in a building. Right. Some do. Right. But generally, most companies don't. Therefore, if you have a CF supervisor, chances are they're not going to be mm-hmm. in the building with you. Correct. And that's something that I stress to my interns. I say, I want you to be as independent as possible because no matter where you end up, mm-hmm. you're probably going to walk in as the only speech therapist in that building mm-hmm. the first day. So I want you to, to have some confidence in yourself and know that you can do this. There have been times when I've been contracted by a rehab company to be the clinical supervisor for their clinical fellow, and there's nobody else around and no, and that the one, and I have that's to. That's an obstacle. That's a big obstacle. It's a big obstacle, and um, I've been in in settings where I've come on as the as the consultant, and I've had to teach the the clinical fellow how to self advocate. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, this is you know, you can't be driving to three or four different facilities to put your hours in and not being paid for the time and this and that. And so if you go into a SNF, I mean, I love working with the adults. I've loved my years in the SNF and I wouldn't trade them for anything. The SNF to me, I mean, I worked in hospitals, acute care, intensive care. I've worked in home health. The SNF is just sometimes you walk through that door and you're just like, I, you know, it's my second home. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's my, it's definitely my favorite yeah. Said I've, I've done PR in an acute right. care. I've done it at an LTAC. I've PR in in home health, and mm-hmm. it's definitely my favorite setting. But yes, mm-hmm. you have to you have to teach new students to advocate for themselves in all settings because sometimes right. new students just get taken advantage of because they don't know any better. Right, right, right. And one of those ways is uh, is not having the supervision. It's so important for clinical fellows to have that 
that they sometimes they need that instant. What do I do if nursing does this or a patient does this? And they need to be able to reach out to that supervisor or to say, no, I, you know, I'm not going to drive here or, you know, there's a, there's a variety of things that, that this setting does present with, but it can be just a wonderful opportunity. If this is, if you enjoy dysphagia, if you enjoy cognitive, cognitive linguistic and working with adults, that's definitely true. And I always tell people to inter- ask to interview your CF supervisor before you take a job and ask them those questions. Are you going to be around? Can I get a hold of you whenever I need to if you're not going to be around? And they should be able to answer yes to all of that so that they can support you when you need it. Right. What has been one of your greatest challenges working in a SNF? There's, there's a lot. <laughs> Advocating for swallowing, I I have a lot of referrals that are not dysphagia, but they feel that they need to send them straight to me. And usually I have to assess and say, super, we did an instrumental, you need to see a GI doctor. And advocating for oral care, advocating for safe feeding practices, advocating to make sure that their meals are correct texture-wise, that's been a big obstacle for me. And right now, it depends on your staffing. There's a lot of turnover in all departments. Right now, I have a great CNA department that's really on top of things, and that's very fortunate. But that's something that I feel I battle just as a whole, that they think speech therapy is the catch-all for someone who coughs. And it's frustrating because that's not the case a lot. Mm -hmm. Well said. So what would you say would be the top non-clinical skill that clinical fellows would be wise to focus on and develop stepping into a clinical fellowship? Time management, people management, building rapport, Managing behaviors. I always like to, when I interview my students, I ask them what their work background is and any job they've had that they've been yelled at, I feel they tend to do better as interns. I I think that you need to have dealt with the real world and you need to dealt with customer service and you have to have dealt with the general population to kind of prepare you because just because you have a shiny degree that says speech language pathologist, a lot of people don't care. And therefore, you can't walk in and say, I'm the speech therapist. It's time because they're going to tell you to go fly a kite. Mm -hmm. You need to have experience with working with people and building rapport, like you said, so you can start building that therapy therapist patient relationship that you're going to need. Very correct. So Jess, before we get off, I know you've also dipped your toes in home health. What can you share with us about that setting? I like home health. It, it actually, I feel helped me be a better therapist in the sniff because I got to see what happened once they got home and what were actual problems that we needed to address. Very functional approach then. Yes. And I would see these people in home health that couldn't tell me how to dial 911 or couldn't tell me how to safely do anything in their kitchen or had no clue how they were going to get their medications. So those questions that I learned were a lot more common than you would think they are helped me focus on that in the SNF. I ask those questions now because if you can't answer things like that, we got to work on that. We got to have a plan because you can't go home safely with that. And I do it PRN. I don't think I could do it full time. It's a lot of time in your car. Mm-hmm. And it it sounds glamorous, but it's a lot of scheduling and it's a lot of cancellations and it's a lot of time on your phone. And as much as I enjoy it, I don't know that I would recommend it to a new clinician. Mm-hmm. Some people do it and like it, and I get that. But I think that you need to experience your job as a speech therapist in a in a little bit more of a structured setting before you go into home health, because you are really an army of what you have to know. Okay. This is normal, but weird versus, okay, I need to call the police. And there's, there's situations where that comes up and you, you kind of need to have a little bit of experience with people and healthcare under your belt before you wander into people's homes, because it's a much different situation. 
I have been in some of those situations as a yep. speech pathologist. <laughs> I'm thinking back to some of them. Right? I enjoyed home health when I did home health. And I think one of the things that I enjoy about our career is there are times when we just have different priorities in life. And when my children were young, my priority was my children. And home health gave me a schedule where I could um, shift that around as needed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now I'm a professor and, and work in a medical setting on Fridays. And I, you know, it just, it just depends on where we go, what we do. But I would agree with you that a home health is not the best for a clinical fellow because a clinical fellow is when you really want that supervisor to, to be right beside you in the trenches, if at all possible, if at all possible to say, you know, how do I do this? Or, hey, I'm going to go do a video, come with me. Or, you know, let's pair up on this. And it's nice to have other professionals. I have learned so much from nurses and physical therapists and occupational therapists and CNAs and dietary managers. Mm -hmm. it, you learn so many different things that you can take that knowledge with you into someone's house when you, ha when you don't have those people around that you can ask. Mm -hmm. Then that's a really valuable tool to have. Very, very true. So... What has been, I know we've talked about some of the challenges of a SNF. What has been one of your greatest joys? What have you really liked about working in a SNF? When you're the speech therapist, people like to talk to you and they mm -hmm. like to tell you their life stories and they tell you their secrets mm -hmm. and they, and they depend on you and they share stuff with you. And that is really fun. I love learning about people's lives and they're so fascinating. They're mm -hmm. You think you've heard it all, and I promise you have not heard it all. It It's just so fascinating every time you meet somebody new to, to hear their life story and how they got there and what their plans are, everything like that. I really love it. And I love the reflection they have at that point in their lives. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can learn from that. And they improve my life as well as me improving theirs. That's true. I would agree with that. Words of advice for the new speech pathologist. Oh, goodness. People are crazy. And once you accept that, your life will be so much better. <laughs> All right. Well said. Thank you for coming on with us today, Jessica. Thank you for having me. I hope today's conversation has created some aha moments for you and motivated you to become a better SLP continuing to connect some of those missing links between what you know and how to use that knowledge. Thank you for downloading the missing link for SLP's podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, I'd love you to subscribe, rate it, and leave a short review. Also, please share an episode with a friend. Together, we can raise awareness and help more SLPs find and connect those missing links and get the information needed to help them feel confident in their patient care every step of the way. Follow me on Instagram and join the Fresh SLP community on Facebook. Show notes are always available, so come learn more at freshslp.com. Let's make those connections. You've got this.